And so, yeah, now that we're recording, welcome everyone to the first design school update in two months. This is the one for November 28th, 2023. Um, I'm going to mute everyone so that we don't have any background noise um, because I know that it's just uh, simple housekeeping. And the way that these design school updates work is every two weeks, uh, we give a snapshot of what's going on in the design school. And really, it's usually kind of overwhelming because there's so much going on that within two weeks, the world still changes significantly because this is actually a collaboration of multiple landscapes, multiple bioregions, people doing lots of different things in parallel. So there's always a lot going on. And what I want to do today is something of a almost like a reset of our patterns in the design school, because we had really nice rhythms of the meetings and the events that we were doing. And then Regenerate Cascadia came along, this 30-day trip to visit 14 different communities, giving talks, meeting with people all over the Cascadia bioregion. And we had been saying, going back to maybe April or May, we had been saying, we actually think this Regenerate Cascadia tour could be world-changing, could be historic. And I don't know, Claire, do you agree? I actually think it is. Um, something really, really, really big is happening in Cascadia right now. And now I'm just going to tease you all and leave you hanging by, I'm not planning to talk about the Regenerate Cascadia tour today. Because there's so much to tell just about the Cascadia tour that I want to find time where Brandon and Claire uh, Stephen Morris, who did all of the audiovisual support and traveled with us, and maybe the young folks, because we had Quinn and Kirsten from Portland, Oregon, who Quinn traveled with us for pretty much the whole thing, Kirsten for about half of it. And so we'd really like to do a proper update with multiple perspectives. Um, and the Cascadia tour was so big that they had a 10-day summit immediately afterwards. If you go to regeneratecascadia.org, You'll find on their front page about 40 videos, which is all the video recordings from the summit itself. So to summarize what happened there is sort of gargantuan. Um, so much stuff is happening there. But um, what I want to do today is sort of do like a narrative reset, which is I want to introduce the story of what's happening in the design school. So all of you who are new will get a, a little flavor of what we're doing in the design school and then also paint the picture of where we're going. And I wanna do it in a sort of sweeping narrative in the sense of, I just want us to see where we are in the process of birthing a planetary network of bioregions and see what the key next steps are. Not every little thing, because there's too much going on, but I just wanna paint that picture. And then what's gonna happen is, so I have a very small presentation. And then Penny is going to share, um, we're gonna do screen share and she's created a mirror board where she's created a conceptual map, like a diagram of how she sees the planetary of network of bioregions working and how the design school is part of it and how we see it being born so that you can sort of see the architecture of what's being created. And then I think between those two little presentations, you'll see the big picture and you'll see where we are, you'll see where we're going, and then we'll have plenty to talk about. So the last part of today's session will be commentaries and questions from all of you to just be sure that we're all clear and have a shared understanding of what's going on. And so that's the basic idea, which means that um, you will have plenty of time to ask questions and for interaction uh, as soon as we're done with the presentation. And what I wanna do right now is just jump into the presentation. I think I have five slides, so it's really not that much. And then Penny's going to walk through the Miro board to show us the conceptual layout of what this big thing is that we're building, this thing that we're calling bioregional Earth, and that the design school is a part of. And so, by the way, bioregional Earth, in a way, doesn't exist, and in a way, is being born. And you'll see what we mean by that when we share. So, with that said, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. So, here we go. Oops, I actually want to make this like that, and that'll make it easier for me to see. Here we go. So this is our design school update for November 28th, 2023. And what I want to do is um, tell the story 
from one year ago to now in a really brief way, because everything we're doing has taken place in the last year. Obviously, this builds on many, many years of work that came before for many, many people. But the way that the design school came into being started in November of last year when Penny and I made our first visits to Colorado. So for those of you who don't know, Penny is from Boulder, Colorado. Benji, who's um, one of the co-founders of the design school, is from, uh, from Colorado as well and is currently with his mom at his mom's house in Denver. And we did these visits to Colorado and Benji joined us for them. Now we knew Benji before this, but basically we started a process of bioregional activations starting in the beginning of November last year. And the very first visit was to four different landscapes. The West Elks bioregion or the West Elks uh, area, which is the North Fork of the Gunnison River anchored around Paonia, the Roaring Fork River Valley anchored around Carbondale, Colorado, uh, and um, Rollinsville, Colorado, which is the sort of the backbone of the Central Rockies, um, fairly close to Rocky Mountain National Park, and then the Front Range in Denver and Boulder on the side that slopes down into the Great, into the great Plains. So we did this bioregional activation process. And then we came back again in December and did another one where we explored bioregional learning centers and we explored collaborative funding and we explored the Common Land Foundation's model of integrated landscape management and bioregional investment funds. And we started this process of activating bioregions on the ground. Uh, we met Elizabeth Yari, who's on this car on this call. We met her at one of those, one of those talks and gatherings. And so people who came to populate the design school came from these on the ground visits together with relationships we already had. And then in the end of January and beginning of February, we did a two week long bioregional activation tour throughout part of the Great Lakes. This was in the greater Takaranto bioregion in Southern Ontario in the Genesee River um, Finger Lakes area and upstate New York and in the Cuyahoga River area on the south end of Lake Erie uh, centered around Cleveland, Ohio. And we did this activation process for the Great Lakes. So again, it was weaving processes of landscape activation, working with on the ground communities. Then in May, we did this crazy Regenerate the Colorado tour, where it went from the headwaters of the Colorado River, literally the birthplace of the river. Colorado River is born in Rocky Mountain National Park uh, and near Grand Lake. And so we started in the headwaters communities and traveled all the way to the Sea of Cortez in Mexicali, Mexico, telling the story of regenerating the Colorado River and creating a tapestry of conversations across landscapes in different watersheds that are part of the Colorado Basin. That was in May and early June. And then we did a follow-up uh, visit to the greater Tacaranto bioregion. That was, I believe, in July. If I remember my dates correctly, we went back to work with Brian and Susan of Legacy Project. We saw several of our friends, including Susan Graham and Stephen Davies, who are on the call with us now, and others who may have joined that I didn't see. I apologize if I didn't see you. Elliot's here. Elliot's another one. And we engaged in a set of multi-stakeholder strategic gatherings focused on bioregional learning centers and collaborative funding ecosystems to continue building on this work. And then... Um, uh, Benji, together with several other people, organized a Colorado uh, landscape leaders retreat for the Colorado Basin that if I remember correctly, that was in late July or August. My dates are getting mixed up, but a little bit later summer, Benji could tell you the exact dates. Um, and several people on this call were involved in that meeting about how to create a bioregional learning strategy that connects the headwaters and the delta of the Colorado Basin. And many, many other things came from that. And then we did this huge Regenerate Cascadia tour in October, visiting 14 communities in 30 days, weaving a tapestry of landscapes across the Salish Sea, the Willamette Valley, parts of the Columbia River Basin, and we're still all sort of in the tsunami of the after effects of that. There's a huge amount of stuff happening there. And so as all of this was happening, um, oh, by the way, we also did a Colorado River strategic follow-up it was meant to be a vacation where Penny and I took my daughter Elise and we went to Colorado, but we ended up doing really good strategic follow-ups in Carbondale, Peonia, and Grand Junction, quote, on vacation. But uh, we got to hang out with Elizabeth, with uh, Rita and Gwen in Carbondale, 
got to chat with Marta on a call. We got to see Brad uh, Sander in Grand Junction, and it was super productive as a vacation. <laughs> but still, it was part of the work. And so what I want you to notice is that the real backbone of the design school is this work of coordinating actions in real world communities. And so the design school was actually born here on March 1st, which means we started prototyping a process of bioregional activations, launched the design school, and then continued embellishing, evolving, improving, elaborating these bioregional activations. We did a major update for the school that took place just after the Regenerate the Colorado tour. And during this time, we did things like introduce community level memberships. So all of our community level members joined from June onward. And then we restructured the Mighty Networks platform for landscapes for all of the bioregions that are active. This includes the Great Lakes, the Colorado Basin, the Acadian Northern Forest, the Northern Andes, uh, and also um, parts of India and other places that are we're sort of populating a planetary map. There will be more and more as this continues. And then we also practice dispersal of funds because the membership dues that come in for the design school, some of them go into a design school fund. We allocated $5,000 of membership dues to fund part of Regenerate Cascadia to support funding the Colorado Leaders Retreat. And, and that was it. That's what we ended up funding. But we had a participatory process for landscape leaders to request funding from this pool of money so that the membership dues are a community commons to support work on the land. And so all of this is part of the school. And we formed a leadership council with 17 members who are all landscape leaders of one kind or another, or people who are leading key community processes in the design school. And then other things started to happen as well. Um, we received funding to support Benji Penny and myself uh, for a year, and, and many other things started to happen. Uh, oh, also, I should mention that Penny introduced the inner space where they're having the storytelling circles, listening circles like they had yesterday, really working on the question, what does it really take to be someone who can participate in the regeneration of the earth? How do we deal with our traumas? How do we deal with crazy psychopaths? How do we um, <laughs> learn how to work together? How do we deal with our own internal psychological barriers? All kinds of things that Penny as a healer really cares a lot about. So she holds space for that. And she and Lena um, together hold the spaces for that. And so all of this process started to integrate an online community to flow into what's happening on the ground. And then meanwhile, Grace, who actually I see on my screen is the one picture, <laughs> uh, uh, and my Grace had been doing a rethinking economics course for, what was it, 14 or 15 previous iterations. Um, and she decided to bring that into the design school and that started a couple weeks ago. So now we're bringing people into the design school to participate in different kinds of learning activities weaving our efforts. So if you haven't joined Rethinking Economics, go check it out in the design school because what Grace has put together is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone who's participated in it is finding it really powerful. So I encourage you to as well. And then also the Awakening Lands podcast where um, Benji and Anna realized after the Colorado Leaders Retreat that landscape leaders are a special and unusual kind of animal. <laughs> and that it would be good to better understand what makes someone a landscape leader. So they started doing podcast interviews as a sort of, you know, immersive anthropological study, as well as creating really wonderful podcasts. And they started introducing them into the design school. And we may be able to talk a bit more about that later. Penny will have things to say as she's showing the diagrams. Also, the intergenerational zone. Um, this is something that's come up repeatedly everywhere we go that older people in every community on earth, I would argue, um, have a broken legacy where they have a hard time knowing how to do something meaningful in their final years um, as planetary collapse occurs and human extinction is a real possibility. And young people for those exact same challenges have a broken future and trying to mend the intergenerational bond is a big part of the work that Brian and Susan of the Legacy Project in Ontario have been working on, and they're starting to bring that into the school. And then also, we've been working on um, weaving all of this with different kinds of earth systems and cultural evolution webinars, other kinds of teach-ins and trainings, creating deeper in-depth knowledge of things for us to build shared vocabularies. And like all of this is happening, notice I'm not even mentioning everything. 
like I didn't talk about evolving of pro-social context or other things. There's a lot more going on than this, but I just want you to notice two things. First, this, that the focus of the school is the regeneration of real world landscapes, that everything we're doing in the design school is about engaging in real world communities helping them to organize themselves, mobilizing resources into the communities and supporting them to create learning exchanges with each other. And then everything else we're doing, summarized by this graphic, is learning supports for these on the ground efforts. You'll notice everything we're doing with community level memberships, with the leadership council, with the dispersal of funds, um, the, the Awakening Lands podcast, the intergenerational zone, all of these things are learning supports for people to work within their bioregions and to have learning exchanges between bioregions. And this is a difference for most online learning communities where you go online to learn online, to stay online in your online community. Uh, well, we're like, let's go to the ground. Let's work from the ground. Let's weave what's happening with the ground. Let's go online to connect one thing on the ground to another thing on the ground and be sure we don't get lost in the digital and get back to the ground, damn it because earth regeneration is urgent and must be done. And so this is a big focus of the school. So now I wanna just paint a very brief picture of how this huge momentum of creating networks of bioregions, of collaboration between them, of lots of online supports, that we're gonna be rolling out a couple of things. And a big one starting in January of 2024, so in a little bit over a month, is we're going to restructure some of the activities we do into a long form learning journey. So we're gonna initiate a learning journey about how to regenerate bioregions with practical real world applications in all of the landscapes of the design school. And I'll say more about this in a moment, but what's really critical is right now, the word bioregion and words like bioregional learning center are becoming buzzwords and they're becoming completely meaningless. People are throwing them around. They're swatting at them like mosquitoes. They're becoming basically just greenwashed into mush by people not knowing what they are. And so what we're gonna do starting in January is focus on specific strategic webinars and hosted conversations about bioregional learning centers. What is a bioregional learning center? How does one work? How do you set one up? How are we struggling to set them up? How are they in the Genesee River trying to set one up? What does it look like for setting one up in the greater Toronto bioregion? How are they making progress to set one up in the West Elks in the headwaters of the Colorado River? What does it look like to do bioregional learning in the Salish Sea with real world applications with our partners throughout the design school? And this is gonna start in January. We're gonna post this publicly and invite people to join as a way of re recruiting people to the design school and for people who are working on bioregions around the world, we're gonna make this available so that they can join and we can create shared learning and communities of practice with social supports because we've been building all of these social supports. So that's a really big thing that's about to start in a couple of weeks. So in January, that'll happen. In the next week, we'll start promoting it. So look forward and stay tuned. The other really big thing is that in February, the Greater Takaranto Bioregion, hosted by Brian and Susan of the Legacy Project, they're preparing to host a Greater GTB Legacy Project Intergenerational Bioregional Summit. And at that summit, they're structuring it so that we can introduce the idea of bioregional earth and formally and publicly launch bioregional earth into the world at that summit, which is between February 5th and 10th. More details coming soon, but just so you know that our previous work in the GTB is building toward a very strong five-day event that Brian and Susan are organizing and Penny and I are collaborating closely with them to do so. And we're weaving it into the greatest coherence we can for all of the landscapes in the design school. Which means from February onward, we're actually going to be weaving bioregions into continental scale collaborations with primary emphasis in North and South America because of the existing landscapes we're working with, but obviously there are other parts of the world that are already represented and present. There's a lot going on in Africa. There's a lot going on in Southeast Asia. There's a lot going on in places like New Zealand. And so, you know, there's a lot going on in the Middle East. Stay tuned, there'll be more. 
But because we started with an English language focus with our friends and connections, it's got a strong North American initiation, or maybe to put it in indigenous language, a turtle island orientation. But, um, but yeah, we are planning to go planetary and we're working in that direction. So this is what I just wanna briefly name before I pass it over to Penny, which is that we already have a, a bi-weekly cycle that we do, but we're going to update it. So starting in January, we're gonna to move to a two week cycle that repeats. We're in week one on Tuesdays, there'll be a, a webinar on bioregional design focused on bioregional learning centers, collaborative funding e ecosystems, integrated landscape management, and how to do this work in practical terms. Then on Thursdays, what are currently called bioregional design sessions will become the discussion, discussion sessions for these webinars. So I'll have a webinar on Tuesday and design conversations on Thursdays. Then the alternating week, we'll have design school updates like this one on Tuesdays and bioregional updates where bioregions themselves will exchange with each other what's happening. For those of you who don't know, these bioregional updates are a huge value of the design school. People who attend them get a great deal of value out of them. And I strongly encourage you to sign up for them and to attend. So the idea is we're gonna create an extended learning journey on a, a bi-weekly cycle with real world examples from landscapes in the design school and opportunities to participate in them. So if we do a webinar on how do you negotiate the land purchase for a piece of land for a bioregional learning center, and then we know that Jonathan and Victoria are working on collaborating with the owner of a piece of land in the Finger Lakes of New York to set up a bioregional learning center, then we may choose to have the webinar and the Thursday session be about what's happening in the Finger Lakes so that we want to apply this as much as we can to real world examples. And um, also because the Awakening Lands podcast is creating really beautiful real world case studies of bioregional learning in action, that these podcasts will be selectively curated. So I'll work with Benji and Anna who have been hosting those podcasts to say, well, for this week's topic, which is X, we think that this interview with this landscape leader in the design school would be a, a very good companion so that you can hear from a member of the design school how they are doing regeneration in their landscapes as part of this learning process. And so um, that is the process that we see unfolding into the near future. And before I go to the mirror board for Penny to share with you the structures of what's emerging, I just wanna take a pause. Um, I wanted to pause because you'll probably notice that this is not like other schools. There is no school on earth whose classroom is the whole earth. But that is exactly and intentionally our purpose. So I just wanted to name that. And I also wanted to name that one of the key priorities for Penny, Benji, and myself, when we started receiving funding about three months ago for doing this work, we immediately said, now we have to get our landscape leaders funded. And we're working very hard to do this. And so some of our, so like Claire and Brandon who are leading Regenerate Cascadia, they're not being paid to do that. Penny and I were not paid for our time doing it. The money we got from the grant paid our travel expenses. And so this challenge of funding landscape leaders is very, very serious. And so, um, just to name that as an example. And Stephen Morris, who paid his own way to volunteer and pay his own travel expenses to do all the live streaming and all the video documentation of Regenerate Cascadia, wouldn't it be nice to fund that in the future, is that this is a strategic priority for us in the design school is to fund our landscape leaders. And so some of them are funded, some of them partially. Like Roberta Hill, who I think is still out here on the call, um, she has been working to get funded through the Center for Ecology-Based Economics in Maine, where she's worked for some time. And so there are some people further along than others, but this is a key priority because if the weaving of projects in landscapes is actually happening, all of us are going to learn from it. So the way that we fund the design school is to fund the design classrooms, which is to fund the landscape leaders for their work. And so this is an unusual observation in most contexts, but it's obvious in this context. 
that our landscape leaders doing their work is why we all get to learn. And then people pay, pay $5 a month or $50 a year to be in the design school to participate in this because we're creating, we're inventing the funding models as we go because no one's ever done this before. So that's my little pause. And now I wanna go back into Miro board mo uh, mode for Penny because I want you to see how we're structuring all of this so that it starts to make sense. How could we possibly hold this complexity? And that'll be pretty obvious to you with what Penny's gonna share. So let me share screen again and then jump over to the Miro board, which is right here. Okay. okay, over, oh wait, let me just move that away. Over to you, Penny. All right, thank you. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is starting from the very top level, the bioregional earth level that Joe mentioned in his presentation. Um, and talking about it in terms of if, if we think about this as um, the bioregional earth is the planetary network of bioregions. But if we start to think about it in terms of websites or like structures in the online space, um, we're going to, the first layer of this is going to be a website for bioregional earth with a story of what bioregional earth is. And then these two aspects here that you see on the screen. So on the right is the Planetary Bioregional Learning Exchange, which is what we're doing in the design school. So if you think about the design school is what's happening on the ground, but in the online space, what we're doing there is we're doing this, the learning exchange. And then on the left here is the, the actual bioregions in the network and how they're gonna be represented um, with websites that is particularly Brandon's working on creating multi-sites for. So, I think I'm going to go to the left side first and come back to the design school. So on the left side here, if we're, we're thinking about what's represented here are, are the idea of having websites for each of the major bioregions or regions that we're working in. So right now we're working in the Great Lakes, in the Colorado River Basin, in Cascadia, the Northern Andes, and Acadia. And there's others coming online now. There's um, Elias in South in in Africa and um, some stuff happening in India. So those are going to be coming online as well soon. So if if you think about a website for each of these regions as like a a top layer, and then if you go down, then here's an example of what's happening actually happening in Cascadia right now. So Brandon has set up a site for Regenerate Cascadia, and that's the green the green box there. And then underneath that, in this multi-site frameworks, he's helping um, the regions that we visited to set up their own websites. So for instance, there's three that are starting to form right now, Regenerate Whidbey, Regenerate Eugene, and Regenerate Bellingham. And they're creating their own sites to start to organize their communities. And then if you look to the right, so there's the, the landscape teams that are starting to form in these areas and they're doing their own organizing in whatever way they want and then they're gonna be organizing their communities. And underneath that, which I don't have depicted here, but there might be like watershed teams within, like within Whidbey Island, there's more than one watershed. So there's gonna be different layers and you can start to see the, the fractal nature of, of how this is coming together. And then on the left side here, um, Brandon's also gonna be forming a membership community just for Cascadia. And he's gonna be, creating a Landscape Leaders Guild for Cascadia as well. And I'll talk about how that parallels with what we're doing in the design school in, a, in a minute. Just a comment, the yeah. membership community would be like the design school has its own Mighty Networks platform. It's an online community space. They're gonna create a Cascadia online community space. Yeah, and particularly the guild, the Leaders Guild is for the, the, the landscape leaders in each of these regions. And like in Whidbey Island, the landscape leaders will be coming into this guild. And then, yeah. Um, so you could start to see this nested structure that start, that's happening. And it's, it's what happens when you start to see this structure is how simple it is. Like this is actually a really simple fractal structure that's starting to unfold. So at the top level, we have Regenerate the Earth. That's by Regional Earth. Then as an example, we have Regenerate Turtle Island. That's the North America continent. Then we have Regenerate Cascadia as an example. 
uh, as a regional bioregion as the bigger scale within a subcontinental scale. Then we have like, for example, Regenerate Whidbey, which is in the next layer down, that's Whidbey Island within Cascadia. Um, then we have Regenerate the Sonomish, which is a watershed within Whidbey. So you can see that we can start to have the structures in the online space to help organize to help organize the people who are on the ground working in, in each layer and to have them connected with each other in this multi-site so that every all that data is shared across the different layers. And just as another example, regenerate the earth to regenerate Turtle Island could then go to regenerate the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Then it could go to regenerate, uh, maybe it's like the Finger Lakes and then it could be regenerate, regenerate the Genesee River just to show examples of what we're talking about. Yeah, this, this applies to everywhere on Earth. Yeah. Um, can you just zoom out a little bit and we'll go over. So then we'll go over to the design school side. So this is the the design school is holding the planetary, the planetary learning exchange. So the exchange between these um, larger regions, the larger bioregions. So the exchange, the learning exchange between Cascadia and between the Colorado River Basin and then everything that's embedded within those. So the leaders and the people in these uh, in these landscapes can come to the design school to start to learn and exchange information uh, across the planet. So that's where the design school is holding, in the, at least in the online space. So you can see down here um, what we're going to be rolling out. Well, what we've already rolled out is the membership community. That's on the right there. And that's what you're part of now. On the left is this Landscape Leaders Guild. And this is this is coming out of a process that Benji and Anna have been in um, with the podcast. If some of you have seen the Awakening Lands podcast and some of the, the interviews they're doing with the landscape leaders, um, unfolding out of that is, is going to be a leaders guild. And Benji can talk more about that if, if you all have questions. He's here today, so you can ask him any questions you have about that. And that's going to be coming soon and also integrated in with this, um, the, the learning journey that Joe talked about, the where we're gonna be focusing on bioregional learning centers and other aspects of bioregional regeneration. The, the Landscape Leaders Guild is gonna be closely integrated with that process. And yeah, and then scroll down a little bit. Um, some other changes in order to start to implement some of these things in the design school. So the top thing is what Joe already talked about, this bioregional learning center's learning journey starting in January. And then in March, probably around March, we're gonna be changing the membership model in the school itself. Um, right now we have these two levels, the design level and the community level membership. And we're just gonna, we're gonna take that away and just have one level of membership, but with an option to basically donate at different levels. So. People could choose the $5 a month option, or if they want to donate a little more into the school and into the fund, they can choose other options like $10 a month, $25 a month, and just make it accessible to anybody at whatever level they want to contribute. And then this is going to allow the, the, the leadership guild to be within the school as a specialized area that um, those leaders will probably be paying $50 a month to be in the leadership guild. And um, we're gonna be working with, with the landscapes to help sponsor those leaders as much as we can to be in that and to be into that guild. Um, do you have anything else you wanna say about that part? Um, no, I think that's fine for now. Okay. And then I'm also gonna be simplifying the Mighty Network structure within the design school. As I've been, as we've been learning um, what's useful, what's not useful with all the different spaces for landscapes, um, most likely we'll just be simplifying that into these bigger bioregional regions um, for the sharing and learning across landscapes in the in the online platform. And then we'll be having these um, Zoom sessions, the learning journey to really, really integrate um, the learning across landscapes. One other thing I'll just mention that is really, that's coming up, um, yeah. One other thing to mention is something Brandon's really working on as well, um, which is the basically like the information ecology. How do we how do we 
share information across all these bioregions and store it and store the data and share the data and that kind of thing. So just to mention that's coming as well. And Brandon's really, really uh, keen on that and working with a lot of good people in Cascadia. So I think that's it on my end. Yeah, so um, I hope that paints a picture for you that as we've gone through this last year, we've really learned a lot about how this is naturally structuring itself and then how we can work with these naturally occurring structures of what we call like literally the nested levels of reality. Reality is organized this way already. So we organize ourselves the way reality is. And reality is organized into things like watersheds, regional climate systems, larger hydrological systems. So for those of you who are familiar with the Salish Sea, or if you know the Great Lakes, which is a massive basin system. It's a single hydrological system, which is pretty incredible. And, um, and we're just working with these natural patterns. And so what we'd love to do is just open this up to any questions that people have about what we're doing and how this is coming forward. For those of you who are new, this might be a bit of a, like a, what? I've got to take this in. I'm not sure what you mean by that. But so we're happy to answer any of those questions as well. Um, and uh, and so we just like to open it up. And because there's so many of us here, if you can go down to the reactions button at the bottom and raise your hand so we can just take you in sequence for anyone who has a question. We would love to hear from you. And Elizabeth, yes. <laughs> Hi, I don't know how to do my hand other than this hand. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what Benji wrote in the chat, and that is that it's Regenerate Earth, Turtle Island, um, Paonia, and even my street here, I think, and me. So Regenerate Elizabeth. I think it's important to come back to the human yeah, definitely. <laughs> that I was responding to someone who sent me a private message. Like, there you go. All right. Are there any other questions that people have or um or comments that you have? Mm -hmm. Is the silence because no one was listening? <laughs> 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 I'm joking. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Pat, please. Well, I, I can't wait to get the recording of this meeting today, uh, because what I want to do is uh, put it out to people I'm involved with um, and in schools, teachers with their program, um, because uh, I just want to do what I can to support the design people, people out in the fields and see find a way that I can uh, do something locally in my own a piece of the bioregion I live in in Marin County in California. So thank you so much for this. No, thank you, Pat. And it's really good to have you here. And I think um, just to name that connecting with schools is a really good idea, especially high schools, because these kids really, really need to stop being told that the solution is to march and protest, but to actually do something, to do something actually empowering will keep them from committing suicide. Those of you who work with young people, you know that the ecological anxiety of young people is crushing right now. It's absolutely horrible for them. So they need different pathways. Um, Colin, great to see you. Come on in. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I love the uh, fractal nature of the graph or like the, the Miro board that was shared. Um, yeah, those patterns appear within ourselves and within nature. Uh, and yeah, Elizabeth saying, starting with ourselves, you know, the fractal nature of it. But uh, yeah, uh, we spoke a while ago about accepting new bioregions, but I just thought in this group, if you could speak to, um, are you still recruiting? Obviously, you must still be recruiting new bioregions. And what would that look like? Um, yeah, what I would say it looks like is, um, Colin, come talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> like what we're figuring out is that this is an emergent self-selected process. And as people feel ready, they step into whatever kind of leadership they're ready for. And one of the things that we're finding is that bioregional activations are a really powerful process, but it's also really intensive for the local organizers. Don't believe me, just ask Claire <laughs> or just ask Brian and Susan um, that, that basically inviting a bioregional activation is inviting yourself to have a lot of work to do. 
because you're going to have a bunch of excited people in your bioregion. And so, so it's not free, if you know what I mean. <laughs> like it's, it's like you're basically setting yourself up for responsibility. And so, um, heck yes. Uh, just so you all know, Colin has asked about this before, and he's based in the uh, the Canadian Rockies. And so, so we will be talking more about how to do this. And we feel a very strong coherence of Turtle Island as a whole to just continue connecting with more and more of the North American continent. But um, but yeah, so we will talk soon. And the basic idea is as you feel like empowered and clear about what you what your personal calling is, I really wanna start organizing this. Then to be able to connect with other landscape leaders for mentorship, for just simple emotional support and connection, to have people you can talk to about this stuff that know what the heck you're talking about. And then also to invite a bioregional activation, which is a, a process, not a process procedurally, but it's like, to organize local organizers, to make things happen, to do the follow-up is a lot of work, um, but it's really powerful, rewarding work. And since Claire stands up, when she gets here, she may speak to that. Um, but for now- I just want to follow up. My challenges is uh, in getting more involved in the di design school is just, uh, there's so much work to be done out there. And you know already it's hard to uh, commit to uh, all these Zoom calls and things like that, but uh, winter might be a good time for it. Yeah, and we hope that these Zoom calls aren't so enticing that they distract you from the real world. We actually want to do the work in the real world. So, yes, please, more of what you're doing, Colin. <laughs> Thank you. Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, Penny, as well. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. I, I caught my son's cold uh, from last week. Um. I guess I, I just want to reflect on the journey that you've taken us through. It's incredibly ambitious, what you've accomplished in the last 12 months. Um, I applaud you for, uh, for your organizing skills. Um, I trust you to rejig the organization as appropriate, given what you've said. This is an emergent self-selective process. Uh, I know you're behaving in good faith. Um, and, and I and I trust that as well. Um, I really hope you're taking time to take good care of yourself. I, I worry about you both. I really do. You're carrying an enormous load. Um, and I hope you've got the support around you to uh, help you sustain yourselves while you're on this cutting edge, because this is a cutting edge. And leadership at this scale and at this level of intensity, um, you have to regenerate yourselves to do so. And, and, you know, we're just three weeks away from the solstice now and the light will return, but I, I really hope you have some time for yourselves to be fallow and, 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 to, and to care for yourselves because uh, this work is too important for us to fail. And uh, yeah, I just wanna say thank you for this briefing, this is uh, a wonderful evolution of things and uh, power to all of us in this quest. Mm. Thank you, Stephen. And I just want to give a shout out to Brad because Brad is making it possible for us to have some recovery time, which is that Penny and I are going to go spend two weeks in the Utah desert and um, leaving in mid-December. And um, Brad has helped connect us to some supports to make that easier to do um, because we have not been given the time for recovery. And now we are pushing the boundaries out and saying, no, it's it's time to give ourselves time. So um, so thank you for naming that. As uh, it, This is a lot to carry and we feel beholden to all of you. And also I've got a nearly seven-year-old daughter that I wanna see as an adult. So I have a personal investment in staying alive for a while. Um, so thank you for that, Stephen. It really, really touches me. It really touches us. Yeah. I'll speak for Penny on that one. Um, Mark, over to you and welcome. Thank you very much, Joe and Penny. Um, Mark from Bristol in the UK. My question, that was a great overview for me and uh, put everything in perspective. It's colossally ambitious. Um, 
as has been said. My question is a bit of a parochial one, really, uh, and refers to the UK. I wonder, and forgive me if I can search this information up online, but I wonder what kind of membership um, you have and, and whether you have any sort of emerging current leaders or emerging leaders in the UK um, or nearby in, in continental Europe. Thank you. The answer is yes. And the specific person you should reach out to first is Richard Coates. Richard Coates is working on organizing the River Thames. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so he's not too far away. And uh, his background is in uh, therapeutic practices and cognitive neuroscience, and then also pro-social practices. But he's very, very, he's just like taking his steps, very engaged in figuring out what it means to organize a bioregion. And if you're not familiar with the work of Isabel Carlisle and others in the Devon region and in Totnes, um, they are not in the design school, but we are all friends in the world. And they're doing a lot of really good work there. And there are some close, close overlapping connections. As for other parts of Europe, um, we have burgeoning conversations in Spain, Portugal, places in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, it's, it's all sort of, but we have someone in, in France who's interested in doing things that basically what we're doing is like a new pattern. So people don't know it. They come to see the pattern and they say, oh, I should do that pattern here. Or I was already doing this, but I didn't know that it was a pattern that others were trying to do. And so that's where this is all accelerating. But I would say if you just go on to Mighty Networks and look for Richard Coates and send him a private message, he's very approachable, very sweet, very sincere. And the two of you will get along great. And that would be a good first step. Thank you very much. I think I met him at a fireside, uh, if that's the right uh, term, uh, chat a month or two back. So, uh, yeah. And thank you, uh, Benji and Grace, for your comments in the chat. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And also, um, Grace is on here. She's doing things in some different parts of Europe and the Mediterranean to be continued. But yes, there are inklings and movements. And now over to you, Claire. Yeah, I well, I just wanted to, um, well, first of all, thank you. That was amazing. And thank you, Penny, too. That's, yeah, doing what you do really well. <laughs> um, I, but the thing I really wanted to just emphasize and just, uh, just share my gratitude for is your emphasis of the work that's happening on the ground. Um, I think that is the thing that stands out over and over again. It can be... Um, it can look like you're talking about the same thing, but actually if it doesn't involve the work on the ground, there's something that gets missed. And it gets, I, I've been working in this space for, you know, over 30 years in different different ways, like in the cultural, community cultural development mostly. And um, that's the thing that I kept seeing is that um, this really important element keeps getting missed. And so, um, and it can actually only happen, the, the work, I know that that came up when you were doing Refi Barachara, where um, unless you actually know how to cooperate, the work actually can't happen. And so, um, uh, unless, yeah. So anyway, so I just um, like sticking at the way that you're, and being able to tell the story so coherently, I I keep feeling as if I fail in that in that way and so I'm just grateful for the people who can help to really share the story so I that's all just to say thank you because this is so important and actually and the other piece just to say is um you're right I think there are a lot of other groups that are trying to tell exactly the story the co-opting of um the bioregional or the use the greenwashing of it or the taking over it sounds like it's the same thing but um yeah Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know Penny had something she wanted to say, so I spotlighted her. Yeah, I just wanted to add to some things Claire, Claire is saying around um, the team that we had going through this 30 days. We in, the, in Regenerate Cascadia. In Regenerate Cascadia was um, we went through a lot of really hard times, and somehow, like we we managed to <laughs> stay together through the whole thing and support each other through the whole thing, and how critical that that is the and how um just that that this is happening on the ground in every region these strong core teams it's it's key to to the whole thing and just to name like it was an incredible challenging beautiful process <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to add that one of the examples of this that's happening right now is um, there are people working in parallel spaces. And one space is there's a group called Kinship Earth. There's a group called Gaia Union. There's a group called Seeds, which is a cryptocurrency regenerative finance. And these are networks of people, right? Each of them are different networks. Ken Shepworth works with indigenous leadership around the world. Um, Gaia Union is helping to create flow funding to support bioregional regeneration in Latin America, globally, but starting a lot in Latin America. Um, the Seeds community is a global network of people trying to reinvent finance and organizing for, for regeneration. Then there's this um, collaborative funding ecosystem that's being led um, by Bill Bowie and Ben Roberts. And, and they are trying to weave people around regenerative communities networks. And all of them are talking about bioregional learning centers. They're all talking about networks of bioregions. And what we're finding is people are really excited about this, but they don't necessarily have like a technical or experiential understanding of what these concepts mean, which means no one's greenwashing. It's not intentional at all. It's just that there's not a shared understanding of what it means in practice. And so we need to create communities that learn together with sufficient rigor and clarity that they accumulate really strong shared understandings. And so, um, so just to name, notice that there's no negative intentions, no one's co-opting, no one's lying, no one's cheating, none of that at all, but it's just the mushiness of these concepts because they're really complex and nuanced. And so I just want to name that because um, that's something just in the last week that that Penny and I have been observing in a few places. And we're like, how do we help create good social supports for sustained learning so that, so that this mushiness doesn't stay and so that it really does become rigorous and well-grounded and coherent and something we can build upon and bring people into and say, no, this is what we mean by bioregional learning. Because it turns out it's beautifully rich and complex. And uh, not in a negative way, it's just beautiful to learn stories of place and how to live in a place and what it means to be bioregional. Like being bioregional is much more than just organizing a watershed, even though organizing a watershed is part of it. And so, so there's a lot to be said there. And I just wanted to name that. Um, we're all learning together and we should hopefully be learning more and more together, you know, creating shared understandings. So, yeah, are there any other questions or comments? Because if not, we can start to bring this to a close. Yeah, um, can I just jump in? Hi, Joe yeah. and Penny and everyone. Hey, Will. How's yeah, hey, good, thanks, how are you? Good, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've been really enjoying uh, as my farming season slows down, like seeing more of the design school and um, I was just curious if someone could outline what a landscape leader would be. And, you know, like w once I get more time, I, I would love to be able to share and hopefully coordinate some of this stuff that I'm learning around the soil food web and that kind of thing, like for agriculture, um, regenerative agriculture, but I'm not sure how to fit in with with that and so yeah i was curious about the landscape leaders mm, this is such a good question because you're sort of asking two questions at once and, mm -hmm. and that's what i love about it so one thing is uh we are figuring out what landscape leaders are <laughs> and, and i mean we ourselves as landscape leaders are figuring out what we are as landscape leaders because there's this internal discovery this discovery together but what I think is really beautiful about what Benji and Anna are doing right now is they're identifying patterns. And one of the patterns is every landscape leader is unique, mm -hmm. like a fingerprint. There's something absolutely beautiful about that. There's something beautiful about the, the idiosyncrasies of landscape leaders, but there are also things that are shared. There are ways of being a system thinker, ways of orienting toward uncertainty. There are ways of being creative, there are ways of dealing with adversity. There are things that are shared. And so I, I see this as a discovery process. We're learning it together. But then the other thing you were talking about specifically was, was like regional food systems. And it made me immediately think, think of Gwen Garcelon in Carbondale, Colorado. Although I could think of others, but she's just the one that came to my mind. 
because she has already been hosting multi-stakeholder groups around the food shed in the Roaring Fork Valley. And I think that there are beautiful parallels to be found between what she's doing and what you all are doing in Caledon. And so, you know, having visited you in person and seen some of the stuff that's happening there in Southern Ontario, it's like, yeah, there are beautiful parallels and beautiful differences. And so I think creating focused areas on things like food security or weaving of food webs or other, you know, we can frame it in different ways, but having landscape leadership around thematic things like watershed restoration as it relates to rewilding, where now I'm looking at Elizabeth, because I know that's some of what she's doing in Paonia, but we also have Brian Kirklevitt in Bellingham, Washington, who's doing it beautifully. He's not in the design school, but we can make these kinds of connections. So I see landscape leaders taking many forms and we're gonna try and create some, like I would say loosely held typologies <laughs> because they are so idiosyncratic. But, um, but your question is what Benji and Anna are grappling with. So you could talk directly with them about it. And I don't know if Benji or Anna has anything to add before I go to, to Elias or not. Or does that feel good? Uh, that that feels that feels pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely in a discovery process right now. We want to invite you to listen to the podcast. We have a conversational space in the Awakening Lands space in in the Mighty Networks platform, uh, and we're just really excited to to be on this discovery process with all of you, with so many other landscape leaders. And it's been really fun for us to see the nuances, to see the variety of forms that it takes. You know, it it almost always it, it always has something to do with carrying processes for bioregional learning, uh, but there's so many different forms that that takes. And and you know, to categorize something that maybe shouldn't be categorized, there's like community workers, there's um, the, there's ecologists that are educating youth, uh, there's community artists. So maybe that gives you a little bit of a flavor, Will. But this has been really fun. They're all inspiring. I can tell you that for sure. They're all really inspiring and I like all of them a lot. Uh, they're easy to interview and make really good podcast episodes for. Maybe that's a criteria. Um, no pressure, everybody. We want to interview you all. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's that's all I've got to say for now. I don't know if Anna wants to add something to it. And I got a bee that just joined me. And anything uh, that we're going to release? Yeah, come on in. Yeah, I think that uh, kind of some of the patterns that you had mentioned too, that they tend to be um, uh, people that seek belonging and have a strong connection to their landscape, people who um, who really like to share in community processes with people too. I think that that's really the critical thing is that they're not doing it on their own, that they're really leading um, learning bioregionally. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And now over to Elias. Um, yeah, I, I want to say uh, congratulations uh, for all the work you've done, and I hope you have time to to rest and regenerate and uh, and celebrate and be proud of all the this amazing work. Uh, and my question is, uh, uh, well, my my English is poor, so I try to find words. Uh, so between those uh, layers or hollows of regeneration from personal, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, to earth regeneration, uh, I wonder if in this school we are exploring also uh, new ways to see bioregions, like, for example, uh, olive tree bioregion, uh, where we do a lot of uh, olive tree monoculture. And if we find ways to... Uh, uh, transform these monoculture into a different system like food forests that are much more productive and much more uh, maybe lucrative or interesting and uh, durable. So maybe if we can collaborate within the, this kind of bioregion just by exchanging uh, information and knowledge and uh, also maybe funding and activation tools. So is there is there uh, a space to explore, or for example, by regions uh, of people who live on the coast of the Mediterranean, where they their livelihood uh, used to be based on fishing and uh, also some farming. So they have uh, a very shared uh, common culture. 
uh, spread around Mediterranean that can be different from people who live maybe 100 kilometers away from the beach. So, yeah, are we exploring this kind of uh, uh, structure or pattern for regeneration? The answer is yes. And if Keala is still here, I think if I remember right, it was Keala who really started talking about sister bioregions as a concept. And the idea of a sister bioregion is not that they're next to each other, but that they're kind of like, they have a family resemblance. Like an example is I'm in a tropical dry forest. So anyone who's doing dry land restoration shares something in common with what I'm doing. And you might also have mountain areas. You might have coastal areas. You might have freshwater, salt water, like the salmon that run in the rivers but live in the ocean. So there can be ecological or cultural similarities that are shared between places, even if the bioregions are very far apart. And I think that this is a very powerful idea. Um, this is the idea of ecozones or of biocultural hubs is another word that I've heard for this, where you look for the similarities to create direct learning exchange. Like there are parts of Portugal that are similar to what we're doing in Colombia because we are in a landscape that is kind of like desert, kind of like tropical, and it's tropical, and there are some things in common. And so I, I find this way of thinking to be very powerful, that it's not just bioregions that are next to each other or that are physically connected in the same larger weather pattern or, or plate tectonic geologic pattern, but that they share things in common. It could also be the kinds of indigenous cultures and the type of uh, economic systems that they had. Like if there was a Bedouin a semi nomadic uh, foraging culture or a horticulture culture, that was the ancestral way of being. I think there are a lot, of, there are a lot of ways to look at this and I find all of them valuable. <laughs> so the idea is to, to find the multiple ways that are helpful for us to learn together is maybe the way that I would say it. <laughs> um, so I hope that's a good enough answer for now and that, um, and I'm really glad that you're speaking in English. Uh, my Spanish, when it was really bad, I was very glad to have help. So, um, so I appreciate you speaking um, and sharing. And, uh, and I wonder if there are any other questions or comments before we close, um, before we come to an end. I know Rita had raised her hand about wanting to share some constellation work that she, that she was involved with. So Rita, over to you. Thanks, good to see everyone. Um, yesterday, uh, the Weavers journey, Gwen and I, uh, with support from others, did a um, constellation on the Rock Fork watershed within Lake Verkirk and Lika. And it was incredibly powerful and revealing. And um, we're going to debrief on it later this week and I'll, we'll send some notes, but I'm going to strongly encourage any um, of the watersheds who haven't met to and Lika to connect with her and consider exploring the constellation as a way of showing, bringing clarity to situations in a very powerful way. So good to see you, Joe and Penny. Uh, missing you a lot. And um, Benji, and good to see everyone here. That's me. Mm, thank you, Rita. So um, one thing I want to name that is absent from this call is all of the details about what's happening in the landscapes. That's intentional for two reasons. One is we need a coherent story to be able to hold all this. And the other is that there is so much going on, we could not cover it in one call. But um, one thing that I think is really important that is emerging is that there are patterns that are shared in every landscape. And I just wanna name a couple of patterns that are shared. I sort of named them earlier, or some of them I named earlier. One is this intergenerational relationship between older people and younger people that is everywhere. Another is the idea of a bioregional learning center is immediately appealing and intuitive to people, which is to say we can start organizing our bioregions 
by spending five minutes saying, this is what a bioregional learning center is, and here are examples in my community that are already kind of like it. How could we bring them together? And this makes a lot of sense to people everywhere we go. We also find that the idea of funding bioregional learning centers is easier to grasp than funding the weavers who are weaving all of the projects in the territory. So you can fund the person doing the weaving by funding the creation of a bioregional learning center to pay the person to do the weaving. All these interesting things that just, how do you talk to someone who wants to donate or invest money in this? And that's just one little example. Another thing that we're seeing is that, um, as Claire said, there is profound coherence in this. And that coherence is usually new for people. So when we did the Regenerate Cascadia tour and I would give a talk, I remember one example when we were in Eugene, Oregon, there was a woman who came up to me afterwards crying and she grabbed me and gave me a big hug and said, I've been waiting 40 years for this moment because of how coherent the story is, because it makes so much sense. And because what we're doing is grounded in reality, like, you know, the watershed already organized itself. Maybe the humans could work with the way watersheds organize themselves. That just makes sense. You know, most people have never thought this way, but once you say it and you show them a picture of a map, it just makes sense. And so the coherence of this should not be underestimated. It's such a big deal how coherent this is. And so for us to collaborate with each other with that coherence is a really big deal. And so um, I'll stop there because there are more things I could say, but um, I wanna close today by saying that I'm about to go into another process. In 20 minutes, I'm gonna start a, a three hour meeting of the Territorial Foundation of Barichara, where we are creating a bioregional learning center, where we are like four years into creating a collaborative funding and governance ecosystem and if I was not doing this on the ground in the real world with real people, I would have no place to say anything to you. And I'm not saying that to say you should trust me. I'm just saying, this is how we do it, is that we do our own work in our own communities and we collaborate with each other online. And if we're not doing both, we're not really doing this planetary work. Now, there are people doing the work in their own landscape who do not need to come online. But those of us who come online are doing it to connect and learn between landscapes, to mobilize resources between landscapes so that the work on the ground can be done better. Jan, who it's lovely to see. Hi, Jan, it's great to see you. <laughs> Jan was with us last year at the Refi Body Char event where he and I got to sit together with Penny and a few others and watch a bunch of tech nerds who sit at their computers too much, go and visit regenerative projects on the ground. It was life-changing. And so this ability to do both, to work online and exchange with each other, and then go into real community processes on the ground, this is what we must do. And so um, that's what we're role modeling as a design school. And that's what we feel is, is the way to go. So this nested level of reality that Penny showed of of, you know, regenerate Cascadia, regenerate Whidbey, regenerate Snohomish, this way of organizing. You don't even have to know where Whidbey Island is or know where the Snohomish River is for it to make sense. Because it just make, it makes sense in the landscapes themselves. So in the next month, we're going to start setting up patterns. Penny and I are going to take some time to go into the desert for Utah is a, a very, very sacred place. Anyone who has not been to Southern Utah, if you want real deep geologic land connection, the deserts of Utah are extremely special. We're going there for spiritual connection to feel what the Colorado River and the Green River have been doing for 5 million years. And, um, and then we're going to come out in January really strongly holding a pattern of bioregional learning processes, weaving into the birth of bioregional earth, and mobilizing resources between landscapes. And so we're here to help you building these support structures any way we can. We want you to work with each other. 
because everyone here is, is a self-selected leader. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, just because I got Day on the call. Day, just so you know, we're starting a regenerative school in Bodhichara for children ages four to 10. So, um, <laughs> bienvenida, <laughs> a Bodhichara. <laughs> um, so this works for all ages. My daughter got to play with Brad's three little boys and it was awesome. Um, we got to have Elizabeth and Pam and Claire as teachers for Elise, which was awesome when we were traveling. And so this intergenerational bond is real for us. Um, and so maybe that's all I'll say for now. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, once I get this video recording uploaded, I'll share it back to the network. I'll have a time delay of a few hours because I'm about to go into a really big meeting, but I'll try and get it uploaded by this evening so that it's available by for everyone to pick up tomorrow. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for showing up, for your great questions and comments. And we're doing this, it's real. So onward we go, onward fellow humans. Thank you so much and talk to you all soon. Thank you.